Awesome. Thank you all for coming to our talk, uh, The Future of Interactive Data Science at Scale with Jupyter and Kubeflow. Before we get started, I think it's worthy of doing some introductions. So my name is Zach. Um, I've worn a couple of hats over my career. Uh, I started as a physicist, a scientist. Um, I did that for about a decade. And while being a physicist, I quickly got involved in the open source software community because I needed to use some of these free tools out there to do my science better. Um, in those early days, uh, I got introduced to a couple of guys working on a project called IPython, uh, which would eventually become uh, working on a concept that be became known as the IPython Notebook and now today is known as Jupyter. Um, so I've been around the Jupyter open source community for a little over a decade, um, and then that uh, launched my software career. So I no longer practice science on the day to day, uh, but I found myself in the space of wanting to build better tools for scientists uh, from those roots. Yeah. Hello, KubeCon. My name is Andre, and similar to Zach, I came from computer science background. Super excited to be here to see all of you. And I'm from Qflow community. So I've been in this community from almost from the start, from 2018, mostly maintaining training operator and KTIP component for AutoML. And also, I have a lot of knowledge of AnimalOps, which we're going to share in this talk. All right, so let us look at that title again and revisit. There's like four words I want you to keep in your head as you go throughout and listen to this talk. Um, that is the future of interactive data science. This really is an opinionated piece. We're presenting what we believe the future will look like for a lot of these tools. Um, and one of the key aspects of that is that it will be interactive. With all of this Gen AI that's coming out, we don't believe that we're writing humans out of the scientific process. Um, in fact, we're just allowing humans to go after bigger and better problems. Um, and so interactivity will be a key component of this talk. Um, science is underlined because at the end of the day, that's what we're all doing here. We're doing science. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and of course, it wouldn't be a Kubernetes conference if we didn't talk about doing this at scale. All right, so appease me, the scientist, for a few moments. Uh, let's talk about the scientific process, because you all have been doing it if you're a data scientist. Um, You've been doing this process that's been uh, perfected over the last few hundred, maybe thousand years, right? The universe is constantly putting out data that you as the scientists are gathering and preparing. You're forming hypotheses. Uh, another word for that is a model for that data. You test your hypothesis um, or experiment against that model. Uh, and whatever you learn from that, you take back to the scientific community um, and form a discussion around it. And this is a feedback loop, a, a virtuous cycle, if you will, um, that ultimately you try to get uh, the, the currency in the academic world, um, but it's also in the business world, which is a scientific publication out the other end, right? Something that you can share with human literature, um, talking about the next step or a little innovation that you've uh, contributed back to the scientific community. And so this is true whether or not you're inside of a business as a data scientist generating reports for your executive team to make better decisions or you're an academic researcher. Now let's fast or, uh, go back 100 years and ask what this looked like. This used to be done in, let's say, 1923 uh, with an individual sitting at a desk working through scientific problems with pencil and paper. Fast forward to today, uh, with all the tooling that we have, Data has gotten big. The problems we go after have gotten more complex. Uh, and this is because of the onset of computers, right? So if you think from 1923 to today, uh, computers came onto the scene that allowed us to collect more data and run computations on that data more efficiently. And then if you get zoom forward to today, 2023, we're at you know, KubeCon, which is talking about this orchestration of multiple computers that allow us to reach a whole nother level of scale um, at processing and computing on data. At that same time, another dimension that has changed as a result of being able to process more data uh, is that the complexity of the questions and the problems that we can go after um, has grown dramatically. And so no longer do you walk into an ap academic research lab um, or a data science team at a company and see one individual working on a problem. Uh, you see a group of people collaborating and working together at the same time to go after these large-scale problems. Too much for one person to solve. So as science has evolved along both these dimensions simultaneously, it's going up and to the right of this graphic. Uh, what we believe you need in order to capture what's going to be going on in the future is we need tools that really uh, promote human-in-the-loop data science. 
You need a blending of groups of humans working and collaborating together with scale, with machines that are being orchestrated um, behind the scene to solve the questions you have. So that's really the point of our talk today. Is what does the future look like? It's more tools that promote human in the loop data science. Another word for human in the loop is interactive. So coming back to the title of our talk, that's what we're trying to promote here, um, is building platforms and tools that really promote interactive data science. We've come up with six, what we think um, are key uh, um, aspects of this kind of experience that we would like to promote. Um, so that is, we've already talked about this, computational, obviously by default. Um, exploratory, which really speaks to that, that human in the loop aspect, really the, the exchange in science is you go test something, you come back, you try it again, you try something new, and you iterate on that process. Uh, it needs to be collaborative by default. So the collaboration experience needs to be smooth, we've talked about that. Um, and then there's this kind of fun one here, which is uh, if any of you have worked in an academic research lab, you'll know that you spend a lot of months doing your uh, science, and then you spend a lot of months trying to formulate that into a paper that gets published. Ideally, it doesn't need to take that long. Those things happen simultaneously. Um, so ideally, a tool that sits close to publication ready. We need to um, take advantage of AI and ML, of course. Uh, and ideally, it's simple to scale. And what we mean by that is we want our scientists, our data scientists, spending their time doing science and data science and not worrying about how they have to scale their computation. Um, that should be easy and seamless. So what better way to do this than to try a demo? So I'm going to let Andre here play my uh, data scientist. He's got a Jupyter Lab window open up. If you're not familiar with Jupyter, we'll just do a, a brief scan. So uh, by the way, we're doing this off a personal um, hotspot off my phone. We saw how demos go with the keynote, so uh, have a little grace here. Um, if you're not familiar with the Jupyter Notebook, they are these documents that weave narrative text with code cells, plots, all in line. They're computational, meaning that you just saw Andre could run a cell, and the output of that cell is right beneath. They're iterative or explorative, because if he wanted to go change that cell, he could go and change it and rerun it and see a new computation come out the other end. Uh, they look a lot like a scientific publication by default, right? And there's tools in the Jupyter ecosystem that allow you to uh, automatically convert these to LaTeX or PDF or any other publication format you'd like. Um, all right, the other thing is each one of these documents are backed by any language of your choice in principle, right? The protocol that defines what language runs underneath these documents is open. Um, in our example, in our platform, we've got uh, Scala uh, integrated with Spark as one of your options. We've got Python kernels. We've got Python with Spark integration. Um, and then we also have Python kernels that have access to GPUs, all powered um, by Kubeflow. You can also see a little icon on there on Kubeflow. We'll get to that a little bit later. Allows you to do some ML ops from JupyterLab directly. Okay, so we'll show that off in a minute. Um, so he'll, Andre will show, he'll open up that document again. One other feature we want to highlight, which touches on the collaboration aspect, is if you've followed the Jupyter ecosystem at all in the last couple of years, they've recently implemented real-time collaboration um, as something that you can run on a system like this. So you can see on that left panel, Andre's got his name logged in. You can also see that on my computer over here, I am logged in. If I open that document, should see that my name pops up as opening that document. You can see that my cursor is right here. And I can say, hey, Andre, run that cell. And those outputs show in both of our notebooks off of a personal hotspot. Don't forget that. <laughs> One more thing, Andre. Uh, he's going to yeah. show that this truly is live. We're not faking this. This is not a video. Um, if he goes over to Zoom, yes, we are going to show a Zoom video in the middle of a demo as well. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Can you see me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe <laughs> it's actually, great. It's great. I'm also here just to prove it. This is truly my, my computer. If we can get it to. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> get away from it. Uh, <laughs> what will, yeah. yeah we'll we'll process might be this. testing bandwidth here. All right, all right. It's okay. That's it's right. Okay. I'll turn off. Yep. The yeah, let's do standard. Yep. All right. So, uh, a couple of things to highlight here. Remember, is we're, we're enabling collaboration in computational documents. So, you can actually see that Andre is typing, and those are showing up in real time side by side and I can see them on my screen. 
So you can imagine this level of uh, collaboration on code. Uh, it doesn't stop at just basic code. It also works with scientific computing. So he can go ahead and generate a plot. You can see the video is lagging a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. That's fine. But the graphs show up on both of our um, computers, and I'll tell you that that's, that lag you see is due to the Zoom call, not due to what I saw on my laptop. Um, I can go ahead and come in here and change and rerun that same cell and get a different output, right? So we're collaborating actually on the scientific data itself. If I continue to scroll down, um, it doesn't just stop at collaborating or locking cells. You can actually type in the same cells at the same time. It's really hard to type and talk at the same time. And we can execute that cell and see that we're actually changing the graph simultaneously within the same cell, right? So collaboration is really on the individual cursor level inside of one of these cells. Uh, and we can do just basic scientific research at the same time without worry about um, overlapping one another. I'll yeah, and I think, yeah, and one really cool thing to also want to show, since Zach mentioned this kernel is baked by GPU, which means we can even do something more. So this is an example, we take the stable diffusion model from Hugging Face, like the open source model, and we can do some prompt engineering together because this notebook is baked by RTC, which means we can work together as a scientist to analyze some open source model. So I've just downloaded my stable diffusion model and I can just run directly you know, some, some examples. For example, I want to generate some image of cat in the space. And as you can see, oh, it's a really funny image. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. So <laughs> it's really interesting to play with this tool. But the thing is, like, if Zach will do some changes on yeah, his side, yeah, and also, you know, video is lagging a little bit, but it's still cool. So, so I'll change to dog, so we can affect the same model in real time. Yep. We just have to wait for network latency. Yeah, network latency is the big issue here, but yeah. all right, it works. So <laughs> yeah, so basically, you can collaborate together on the same model in the one notebook which is really exciting because you can definitely do some prompt engineering and much more to analyze your models. So let me go back to original notebook and show you how I actually power this with Kubeflow and show you the scale of all these problems. So what I'm gonna do, uh, I wanna optimize hi my hyperparameters with Kubeflow and I wanna use my model to recognize some uh, clothing using the fashion needs that I said and just to see how easy it is with Kubeflow to scale my model to do the hyperparameter optimization. So for all of you like to be aware, like hyperparameter optimization is the process to optimize hyperparameters from a model. For example, number of epochs, learning rates, uh, or uh, some optimizers. So what I need to do to try this out, I need to define my training script first. So this is the pure PyTorch API without any changes from the Qflow side. And here I'm defining my training script in my notebook. And basically you can see the parameters as the input of my function. So basically first step, for my model is to create the actual model using the PyTorch. So I have the linear regression model with several layers. Then I'm basically downloading my data set from Fashionist, uh, then using GPU to train my model here. Uh, so the next step is actually model training. So if you're familiar with Torch API, it should be very simple for you to understand, but this is just one step of training here, what's happening. And I'm, as you can see here, I'm using the uh, hyperparameters as a number of epochs of my input of the function, which means like, these parameters will be optimized in Kubeflow. And at the end, I'm just exporting my model back to S3 to do the evaluation afterwards. So first of all, before actually do the hyperparameter tuning, I just wanna test that everything it works, which means like I can try to run this training script locally inside the notebook with just some test hyperparameters. Like I just pass two as number of epochs and 0.1 as a learning rate. So as we can see here, the model is successfully trained on just like several epochs on like few batches, but at least I can see the training is flowing because in the high parameter optimization basically is the process of running your training multiple times or multiple trials, which helps me to understand that everything it works. So what I wanna do next, I wanna actually run the Qflow experiment to tune my hyperparameters. And for this, as Zach mentioned in the beginning, we have this kind of like small really but button of Qflow icon. And what is actually is, is the Qflow UI. And because it's actually baked inside the JupyterLab, I can split it between my notebook and another tab as a Qflow icon. And basically before explaining this API in detail, let me start experiment because it will take some time to complete. So 
experiment extremely, so API extremely simple here. Uh, what just data scientists need to do, they just need to specify distribution for their hyperparameters. Let's say I wanna like uh, tune my number, my number of IPs and learning rate from this kind of distribution. And then I just use the Qflow tune API to start my experiment. And inside tune API, as you can see, I define my objective as a training function. So this is the function that we saw before. Then I define my hyperparameters uh, algorithm. So using Bayesian optimization, Qflow supports many different algorithms out of the box to perform the HPA optimization. And here I just collected my accuracy and loss to analyze the metrics. And this is the trial threshold. And the power of scale, because of it's very simple that the scientists to play with this tool. They can even say, hey, I have like hundreds of GPU maybe tomorrow and I wanna like simply run it. So they just need to modify one parameter to scale these experiments much more. And they can also say like what kind of GPU they wanna use in, like in the resources parameter. So as we can see, this API actually starts experiment not inside a notebook, but in your cluster, in Kubernetes cluster, which runs on several trials and several iterations, and it's happening like the training is actually actually happening not inside a notebook right now. And on the right side, we can see that some of the experiment that I run before already have some results. So in this UI, you consume some accuracy, some other metrics. So let me just drop it here so you can see the full um, UI. Um, yeah, it's the, it's the opposite top. Give me a second. So yeah, if I close this. Yeah, so as I mentioned, this UI representing the, the, the experiment that I ran before. So we can see that few of the experiment already been complete. So right now, now experiment that we just started, the true trials are running. So if I click to experiment that we ran before, you can see some distributions of the hyperparameters here. So this is very useful for data scientists to analyze some data and just to see the results. Also, because we want to like avoid complexity of Kubernetes, we try to represent um, some parameters in a human readable format. For example, in this overview page, you can consume what is the best trial parameters, what is the best trial performance. Also, if I click to one of the trials page, we can see the list of the trials that have been complete or succeeded. Also, we can apply highlighting the best trial with the best optimal hyperparameters. And if I click to the specific trial, we can see some uh, metrics evaluation here and also some information about the trials. So let me go back to original experiment that runs. So we can see that few of the, few of the trials already been complete. And um, also we can see the same information here. If I click on details, it's like additional information for my experiment. If I click to one of the trials that have been succeeded, I also can see the logs uh, here. So uh, as we can see here, and uh, let me try to zoom in a little, a little bit. So this is a training process that we saw in a notebook, but happening at, at several epochs. Uh, just to, to make sure we can actually train our model from from the beginning. And we can see here that the, we're using we have 100 GPUs to actually train this model on several trials. And which is really cool because we kind of like powered this by RTC and we kind of like collaborating together with Zach on this notebook. I can literally um, split my screen, let me try to do it again. So if I open my Zoom on the right side, oh, give me a second. So if I open this, if I try, it's very hard to, so many tabs. <laughs> so if I try to do zoom on the left and my screen on the right, you can see that Zach as the data scientist in my team also can consume some data in the real time, which means we don't even need to jump to other UIs. We as a team can collaborate together on this experiment and do much more in terms of the scale and the collaboration capabilities. Um, yeah, so let me just uh, go back to my notebook and quickly show you um, the rest of the experiment. So once the experiment is complete, um, the next step is actually consume the results and just to understand what kind of like our model evaluation will look like. So at the, at the end of my notebook, I will try to actually get the optimal hyperparameters and optimal model. And as you can see, Qflow offers several APIs for you to play with. So you don't even need to jump to another UI or YAMLs or uh, Kubernetes cluster or kubectl, right? You can do everything inside your notebook. And also, so the next step for me is downloading a model from S3, and I'm plotting model to the torch again, and just do some evaluations. So just to see how my model actually producing the, uh, the actually recognize the images. So I try to pass some test images from data set and just to see. So the green um, signs you can see on the top of the images is the correct prediction, and the red is incorrect. So I can do everything in my notebook because of the, um, the capabilities that notebooks offer, it gives you much more kind of control over what, what I can do. And also I can like do some metrics visualization here as well because using the plotly and checking some hyperparameters distribution be between my minimum and maximum level for my accuracy and loss. 
yeah, let, let's, so this is what we want to show, and let maybe quickly explain what you saw. So I just pass it to you, Zach. Yeah. Yeah, so hopefully you walk away feeling like, wow, first of all, collaboration was simple, writing a document was simple, uh, scaling was simple. All of that is because of the interactivity that Jupyter Notebooks bring um, with Kubernetes backing the scale problem, the orchestration of the scale, and then plugging all that together with Kubeflow. Um, so that's what you saw in this demo. So why Jupyter? And this is a question we get all the time. Um, and it really does check those first four boxes of what we talked about at the beginning of this talk. So um, those six requirements, four of them, notebooks are computational by default. They're exploratory, right? This really nonlinear flow. So you can run them from start to finish. But what scientists, I think, really like about these notebooks is that you can go back and retry a cell over and over again without having to rerun an entire program inside of an IDE. Uh, we showed you the RTC experience. So if you can run this as a system with many users, the collaboration experience is really seamless. Um, and then at the end of the day, you have a publication-ready document. Thank you, Zach. Let me speak a little bit about Kubeflow. So first of all, how many of you are of Kubeflow here? Well, it's actually quite a lot. It is surprising me. So let me speak, speak, speak a little bit about like these two items, about AML and the scale. So for all of you who are not aware of Kubeflow, so Kubeflow is the combination of different services to address multiple step, steps of ML lifecycle. We have uh, components for Jupyter Notebooks, we have uh, components for training operator to run to distribute training on top of Kubernetes. Also we have some Kubeflow pipelines to run ML native pipelines backed by Argo. Uh, also we have components for AutoML, such as Katip, and the case of component for online inference and the uh, um, model deployment. Also, Kubeflow can be run at any cloud when you can run a Kubernetes, where it is um, your local machine using Kind, or your third-party cloud, EKS, Jiki, Azure, or even like on-premises. Also, Kubeflow offers some SDKs as so in the demo and the web UIs for you to play with, so we can have like more um, uh, data scientist-friendly uh, interfaces. Let me just discuss things because I don't have much time to discuss everything. So let me speak a little bit about training and Katip component of Kubeflow. So training operator is the controller, which allows you to run uh, distributed training with PyTorch, TensorFlow, MXNet, XGBoost, MPI, and much more on top of Kubernetes. Also, it supports different type of scheduling mechanism and distributed techniques using MPI. It also can be used for HPC with MPI. We have some examples of actually using API operator for HPC type of task. Also, we support some job scheduling with Volcano Queue and Elastic Training with PyTorch. Also, we have some SDK and API to interact with these interfaces. So similar to training operator, Katip is also the set of different controllers to perform optimization tasks. And as you saw in the demo, it supports hyperparameter tuning with multiple algorithms. Also, we kind of like support early stopping techniques to avoid overfitting and save even more computer resources. We do some research in terms of the neural architecture search algorithms like ENAS to find the best architecture. And it has some experiment tracking UI and work workflow orchestration because it's kind of like built on top of Kubernetes. And similar to training operator, the KTIP component, it's just um, connecting these kind of open source libraries to the cloud native world by providing these simple interfaces to play with. Um, and so this kind of like explain why Kubeflow, we choose Kubeflow as the tool for, to power the AI ML inside a notebook. But what about the scale, right? Many data scientists come to us and say it's extremely hard for them to scale the experiments and push models to production. So we spoke with many people across the industry and the experience for them should look like this. So they want to start a Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter Workspace. They want to do some pre-processing with Spark, Dask, Pandas. Then they want to try, uh, define their models inside this environment using well-known open source libraries. And then want to deploy the models from the simple environment. And the trick is here. This process is actually happening multiple times because you need to retrain your model and you need to reprocess your data. So this is like repeatable um, uh, pipeline. But the problem is like reality looks like this today. There are like a lot of different systems which address different types of ML lifecycle, starting from data ingestion, data preparation, going to uh, building your model, tuning your model, serving your model, right? And even do the fine tuning, especially in the world of large models today. And this is multiple system, extremely hard for data scientists to understand, and that is why they cannot actually iterate on their tasks much faster. So we think that this process should be effortless, and we should spend a lot of time to improve this experience and provide much easier infrastructure for them to play with. 
So how we try to address this with Jupyter and Kubeflow, so as you saw in the demo, experience for them looks extremely easy. So they just start a notebook, they just use the well-known PyTorch API, they don't need to know anything about YAML, Docker, kubectl, or even Kubernetes. They just play with the Python code, with a simple SDK, uh, Python SDK, and they define how many GPUs I have, and how many workers I wanna run. And then Kubeflow is responsible to scale this training or tuning or serving on top of the um, uh, cloud infrastructure, utilizing the compute resources. So we're trying to do simple steps, how to address it. And as you saw in the demo, the first, our like initial step of simplification, all of these kind of ML pipelines, we try to give a user ability to start a training from the function, which means on the left side, you can see that this is pure PyTorch API, where we're using the PyTorch distributed data parallel um, uh, techniques to run my, to start my training on multiple workers. And rank is the world size, and the world size, uh, so Qflow will be responsible to specify rank and world size parameters for your training function. And then basically you just need to wrap your function inside the create job Python API, and you can also consume logs in your notebook. And as I mentioned, this is very simple to scale because you just need to change the number of workers to, um, if you wanna do your training on more workers because large models usually requires much more GPU and much more computer resources to um, run the experiments. So similar to training, we, we try to do the same with tuning. So for tuning, as you saw in a demo, you just define your function, you set the parameters as the input argument for your function, and then you define your uh, parameters distribution in Tune API. So we have the KTIP Tune API to run your uh, experiment from the function, and then you can specify like what kind of metrics you wanna optimize, what kind of metrics you wanna collect, uh, what kind of distributions of hyperparameters you wanna get, and you also can consume the results in your notebook using the Qflow SDK API. So the thing is like the demo that we showed to you looks extremely simple, uh, but the th in reality, this happening behind the scenes. So all this complexity is hidden from the user, which is very important, but when the user actually start the experiment, we have three separate controller, which is responsible to start the experiment customer source, and then we have a suggestion controller, which is responsible to spawn algorithm service with Bayesian optimization algorithm. And then like when the actually hyperparameters are produced by the Bayesian optimization, we have a trial controller who is responsible to start the workers, which basically backed by Kubernetes job. And then we're using the pods to iterate your training on multiple workers. And also we have the KTDB to collect some trial metrics from your uh, training workloads. And we're getting some uh, data set from the fashionist um, open source data. And at the end, we're also exporting model back to S3, so user can also get information about their model directly in the notebook. So this complexity, so we just try to avoid uh, for users to understand all this complexity and be focusing on the science instead of understanding all this kind of um, Kubernetes part of uh, ML life cycle. So uh, let me speak a little bit about uh, how we implement Qflow notebooks together. So we have a separate namespaces for notebooks. We have a separate namespaces for Qflow control plane. And inside the notebooks control plane, we run controllers to who is responsible to spawn kernels, notebooks. Um, and in Qflow namespace, we actually run several controllers for Qflow, like training operator and Katip. So when a user starts a notebook, they're using the Python, Qflow Python SDK to run whether tuning task or training task. And then they have like two uh, resources to do additional orchestration. So Kubernetes has a lot of great uh, tools for us to play with. For example, it has a admission controller. So we have the mutation web hook to provide additional orchestration on top of the open source controllers. And we have a resource monitor for additional observability, monitoring, and also orchestration for the training tasks. So also our training jobs, they have access to the storage, whether it's S3, HDFS, uh, by providing the API as well. So this is how it looks like uh, from the architecture standpoint. And we also believe that the user isolation is very important. We see that our users, they spawn much more than just a notebook today. They should spawn the Spark workloads, Airflow pipelines, Kubeflow training jobs. And we think that the namespace isolation is important because we can control um, much more um, resources by isolating user by the namespaces. So it has a lot of power of like security boundaries and the Kubernetes are back, which is built in. And we have a separate control plane for every um, uh, component that we run for our users. So just to summarize, um, I think it, as you saw, we kind of like combine two open source ecosystem together and also like Kubernetes one, which is extremely powerful for us. 
And at the end, we kind of like have the portable platform which can run on any cloud. It's very simple to use. It's scalable, as you can see, and interactive um, because of Jupyter nature. So, and just to summarize, uh, by, co by uh, combining these technologies, uh, we believe that we kind of like addressing the point that we started at the beginning. It's very computational. It's also collaborative. Thank you to the really great features of Jupyter real-time collaboration. It's well like exploratory. People can do much more in their notebook today than they can do before because of the Jupyter notebook's nature. And they can even like publish the papers with their results. And also, it's definitely like built for IML and it's simple for them to play with the scale. Also, I think I then really want to mention before we jump to the question that this is pure open source project and we really encourage you to be part of the community. We like Qflow and Jupyter, it's extremely welcome community to all the new contributors. So please feel free to check all these links and we shared our presentation in our schedule. So if you want to reach out to us, let us know um, and you can be part of this great community to drive these amazing tools. And also, then, I really want to mention that finally, we're really happy to announce that Qflow joining CNCF as an incubating project. Community was waiting for this for so many years. We're so happy to be part of this great and amazing community and be more closely to other projects that we're already using, like Istio, Argo, Keynative, and moving forward. Thank you so much for listening to us. Um, I think we have a few minutes for answer of your questions. Yeah. Thank you. Can you I think yeah. If, the, yeah, if you want to ask sorry. a question, yeah, please. Yeah, we have to recording the session. <laughs> uh, in collaborative environment, uh, did you run with your own identity? So, like, if you have access to the data, how would you segregate access? So, like, why a person couldn't pull what you can pull? Yeah. So, in this demo that you saw, it's a shared workspace. So everything is shared. There's no. Everybody has equal access to everything. Uh, but we are solving that issue by um, taking the actual like, algorithm that's behind the collaborative merging, the conflict merging that has to happen, um, and basically isolating people into their own notebook servers, and then having uh, the, the collaboration. You share a document, and you collaborate through a proxy between the notebook servers. Um, and that at least isolates people from being able to see anything else in it. They're just collaborating on a document. Um, and the same can happen with that Kubeflow UI. Um, so each piece is basically given like a session that's just live as long as the, the person who owns the resource grants someone access to it. That's kind of the mentality we have. But today it's just in Jupyter default open source, you're sharing everything in the server. There's no RBAC or anything. And then uh, this is in regards to logic, but like the data you pull data in that sandbox for the users as well, right? Say it again. Uh, so you talked about how you uh, share the logic the notebook itself, but like, do you pull the data uh, which is useful for training into that sandbox? Right, right. So uh, I, I think uh, it's a good question. I think it's going to depend on the kernel. So the kernel usually has all of the connection points to all of the data in the way that we demonstrated here. Um, and so uh, in our current way of thinking about it, you don't share the kernel. The person that owns the resource, like the document, is the only person that can execute code. For the, in a context where they can't share things like access to data, it's really owned by one person. Um, expanding that to allow people to actually share data is kind of a, a, a isn't available in Jupyter today, but I think it's gonna be like, we're gonna have to def define roles, scopes, things like that at the Jupyter layer, and we haven't done that yet. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I have two questions. The first one, um, so the demo you showed today was the infrastructure just deployed through like vanilla, like how, you know, Qflow Helm charts, or did you have any custom components like uh, with the deployment? Yeah, so I think I, I can take it. So um, we uh, deploy Qflow by our own, so we don't use like the open source version of Manifest, and we use several components of Qflow. So as you saw, we're using Ketip for hyperram tuning mm -hmm. and training operator for distributed training, but we are looking for expanding, like for example, we're looking for KSERV to so something them uh, as well, but we have like a separate deployment that we maintain and to how to deploy these components on our infrastructure. Okay. Uh, my second question is like, um, you know, data scientists love to use the most expensive GPUs ever, right? Yeah. So how do you, uh, how, as a platform team, how do you make sure that the cost doesn't just blow out of the water? Yeah. You know I mean? Yeah, it's, it's actually a very great point. And we currently working so hard to see how to optimize GPU um, um, cost savings because it's extremely costly. 
especially on top of the cloud. So we're looking for different kind of technologies like the time slicing and fractional GPUs to even optimize uh, more of kind of resources that people are using. And also we have, we're trying to build a like tool um, on top of like monitoring observability to see how we can optimize the GPU resources. Uh, and that is why like, we believe like, this kind of like, namespace isolation and resource constraint is very important to control the number of resources they're using. Yep. Do you use any like, kind of, like, namespace quotas, like resource quotas, anything like that? Or? Yeah, yeah, we try to like, uh, see how also um, Unicorn could help us with uh, you know, advanced uh, resource management or okay. maybe some uh, things like hierarchical namespaces. So how you can basically maintain a quota per team and then share it across multiple team members on the on the on the big team with the scientists. But we also like looking this uh, kind of fields right now. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, so two questions. Uh, how do you guys keep uh, Jupyter notebooks from going rogue? And so what I mean by that is, like, there's always the fine line, and it's hard to figure out. Like, at what point do we need to move this out of a Jupyter notebook? And at what point is it okay? So that's the first question. Uh, yeah, I think we put that responsibility on the user <laughs> of like what they come and tell us, right? Like this fits my a notebook case and this doesn't. Um, I think a lot of the early phases that's more exploratory, um, people like notebooks. I think people really like, I used to pitch that the notebooks were great because they were human readable documents. But I think what they really like about it is the fact that I've got these little like collection of individual code cells. I actually don't cross relate them. I just want like something I can really quickly refer to and rerun over and over again. Um, so I think it's good for that. The moment things start to become like, all right, we want to package this into a function that we share, like importing notebooks, there's not a great answer for that. So as soon as you find yourself using code that you need to import, people den generally will offload that to a, a Python module or you know, some other Scala module and import that in. Um, we leave that really up to them. I don't know if that answers your question satisfyingly. I think, just to it, I think we're also like trying to see how a shareable file system could help us, right? Like, and again, a capability when it can work in Jupyter is the cloud ML environment. So you, you work, because our design is they want to see like the same as they were locally, but on cloud. So, you know, like they can create the Python files, play with them and scale them, right? So not only notebooks, but maybe more kind of like modular, modularity, right? Yep. Yeah, we do suffer from the mm. problem of like our our kernels don't necessarily have access to the file system that the notebook yeah, does. Yeah, yeah, that's And true. so you can see a file sitting next to it, but you can't import it into that code, uh, into your notebook. So, um, yeah, if you have ideas for that, we'd love to talk about it. <laughs> okay, uh, no ideas so far. But <laughs> second question is, uh, so, like, we love the user management, but it'd be super cool if uh, it evolves into, like, team management, because yeah. most mm -hmm. of the time when we're running, uh, we're kind of forcing it right now, but it's, it's not out of the box and it's not Absolutely. super straightforward. So are there things, like, are there stuff in the works to make it easier for teams to collaborate across an org? Yeah, there is, there is. Um, so at the server layer, that's really the place, um, you know, so Jupyter has the Jupyter server project. And uh, before kind of all the role management, group management was happening in Jupyter Hub community, people who were trying to spawn single user hubs and then just manage uh, group membership across individual servers. But within a single server, uh, who has access to what? Um, the Jupyter server group is working on that. Like, how do, we, how do we maintain backwards compatibility with a server that was meant to be a locally hosted app and turn it into something that you can run in a cloud context? Um, so there's, yeah, there's work going on there, but it's, it's, all, it, it's all new, it's all fresh. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think we're doing much. Yeah, I think, I think we might be running over, so we yeah. might chat with you in the hallway. Let's, yeah, let, let's just, Catch up for your questions Thank right you. there. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so you much all. again. Thank you. Thank you.